how to share the gospel. Uh, you know, someone was faithful with you, if you know Christ as your Savior, to pray for you, share the gospel with you, and we are to be reproducing, sharing the gospel with others. But it can be quite the challenge to us personally to say, Lord, can you really use me to be your vessel? The Bible calls that an ambassador, as though God were making his appeal through you. Yes, through you. And uh, we're doing all that we can through this particular series to equip you, but you have to choose to make yourself available for God to work through you. But I want you to gain that confidence to know that he can and he will if we make ourselves available to him. Now, over the past several weeks, when we started this series, we learned from Jesus that we are to die to self, that's very key, take up your cross, your public identity, calling on your life uh, with Jesus Christ, wherever he places you, and then after you take up your cross, you are to then follow Jesus. You can't really follow until you do those first two things. We looked at that very specifically. And then last week we settled that there should be a biblical, scriptural conviction concerning the fact that Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. If we don't believe that, we're probably never going to share the gospel. We're never going to tell someone else. We don't really believe that. We have to know that and believe that from Scripture. Now, we experience it ourselves, but we have to, have to develop this biblical conviction that we know without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. And that's what we looked at last week. And now this week, we will carry on from there and we will learn from Jesus how to engage sinners. Now, this is very important. You can't share the gospel um, with people who are already saved. Uh, they've already had their need met and they've been saved. But we've been called to those who are sinners, those who are separated from God. They've yet to find Jesus, accept Jesus as Savior, make him Lord of their life. It just hasn't happened. But we are to engage them. That's who needs the gospel. Those who are in need of a doctor, those who are sick is the illustration that Jesus himself uses here in the text. Now, to know how to engage sinners, I want us to accomplish this by exposing ourselves today to the lifestyle, not of the rich and famous, but of the Messiah named Jesus. Just in these few verses and others that we will look at, I want us to take a scriptural documentary of the life of Jesus and immerse ourselves in it and say, how did Jesus really live? And if I can learn from him how he lived, that is how I am to live as well. That's what he said. Be holy as I am holy. That's what God said. We are to live as Jesus lived. We're not above our masters. We are called to carry out the Great Commission. He is going to work through us as though we are his ambassadors. He is sharing the gospel through us until he returns. And so we learn from Jesus. And we need to determine and we need to evaluate if we are living as Jesus wants us to before he returns. Now, I believe there's a lot of serious, serious confusion over what the purpose of the church is and how believers are supposed to be living. Um, we have taken on various forms of religion, but religion will not share the gospel. It will demand people um, have righteous acts, but that's not uh, a relationship. So it's not a form of religion. It's not guilting people into living certain ways. Listen, it is about connecting people with a living God through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that lives within us. And that's what we have to help people do. If you'll look in verse 12, and I want to say to you that verses 12 and 13 will be addressed next week. We're going to look at verses 9, 10, and 11. But if you'll look quickly in 12, you'll see that Jesus will respond to the religious leaders, the Pharisees, and say to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, it is the sick. And when you're sick, you're in need. You're in need. The illustration is to go to a physical doctor who can help your physical needs. But the same is true spiritually speaking. You must be in need before you can get the spiritual help that you need. And so Jesus was about connecting with those who are at a point of need in their life, open to what they really needed, 
which was the gospel, which was the truth that God loved them through Jesus. You know, I was reading a story. It's a very interesting story. I'll touch on it here and at the end as well. It was a man who found himself in great need. He had not been in need. He had thought he'd lived a pretty good life, been a pretty good father and everything else. But it was on April of 2013 that uh, Brett Archibald, at that time a 50-year-old South African father of two, experienced an event in his life that caused him to see just how needy he was. He had been out on a boat in the Indian Ocean with some friends of his, and they had entered into a time of food poisoning. All of them on the boat got sick, and it was during the night in 2013 that he went out uh, to lean over the side of the boat because he was going to throw up. And my daughter Hannah's here today, and she didn't want anything about throwing up uh, because she's experienced a lot of that in her early days of being pregnant. But this man went and he threw up over the side of the rail of the boat. And when he did, he lost his footing. And he went over the side of the boat while all of his friends were asleep on the boat. He would experience 28 and a half hours of treading water in the ocean and all that he went through. He battled sharks, jellyfish, dehydration, hallucinations, and many other things during those 28 and a half hours at sea by himself. His story is quite fascinating. He came to a point where he realized that he had not been all that he thought he would be, and um, he found himself in incredible need. A man in need. He was very open to being rescued. He's very open to realizing, I can't do this on my own. And it's just quite a fascinating story. But you say, okay, here's a man, 28 and a half, almost 29 hours at sea by himself, struggling to live. He's in need. He's open. And I want to tell you that genuine salvation occurs when a person comes to their end of themselves and they're in need of a Savior. And that's who Jesus was looking for. We understand this physically here, which is always connected to the spiritual in a person's life. And sometimes the Lord uses both of those to get us to an end in ourselves. But the question is, if Jesus was looking to connect with those who were in need, shouldn't we be doing the same? And the answer is absolutely yes. Are there people who are in need? Absolutely there are people who are in need. How do we connect with them? How do we find them? Well, one, we have to have a heart and desire to say, God, I'll be available to connect with those people who are in need. If your spirit will lead me and guide me, I'll do that. I will live in such a way that you can use me to share the truth with these people who are in need. See, if you had taken a media team or the paparazzi to follow Jesus around, his every move and document it, what they would have encountered is the same thing the Pharisees were encountering, that Jesus engaged people who were in need. And if Jesus was engaging people like that, we've got to say, Lord, we want to do the same. I want to do the same. Don't we realize that Jesus said himself, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. He said, that's why I have come. You look in Mark 1, 35 through 39, and this is when he was out praying early one morning, and the crowds wanted to know where he was. Come and, you know, uh, heal some more people, teach us some more things. And Jesus said, no, I'm going to go somewhere else so I can preach the gospel because that's why I've come. He was looking for the needy. And I'm saying to you today, if the media was to follow me around, the paparazzi, as they did Jesus, what would they find in my life? Would they find me wanting to engage and encounter people in need? In Luke chapter 14, we are told, go out into the highways and the hedges and find those who are lost and in need. We are called to fulfill the great commission. We are called to have compassion the way Jesus had compassion. And when they looked at Jesus' life, they were amazed. Now, I want to say to you that I don't want to just preach what is true. I do want to preach what is true, but I am acknowledging with you today, and I think if you'll take the time, you can do this with me as well, that what I'm preaching as truth today is hard to live. We live in a very hurried, scattered world. We're overcommitted. 
Sometimes we lack the conviction we need to live in such a way that we even can put ourselves in a position to be around people who are in need. But what I want to ask you to do is this. Out of the message we're going to look at today, would you be willing to pray to say, Lord, I will make myself available to you to live as you lived, to have a desire to reach out to people who are in need, to engage sinners as Jesus, as Jesus, listen, please understand, as Jesus engaged sinners, we're going to talk about that, I will make myself available to you. I want my actions in my life to reveal that I'm available to do that for your glory. I will be an ambassador for you. Have you ever told the Lord that? Lord, you said I'm your ambassador. Lord, I will be your ambassador. Whatever that means, I'll do it. I'll open my home. I'll invest money. I will invest my life. I will do whatever it takes to be your ambassador with the gifts you've given me and the call that is on my life to share the gospel. That's who God's looking for. So today, with those thoughts in mind, I want us to look at the how and the why that Jesus engaged sinners. I want to share three things with you out of the first three verses. They overlap as we go through, but they help us understand fully how Jesus was living and how the Pharisees saw him and saw what he was doing and how he was living. And we need to do the same. So let's take a look at this documentary of Jesus' life and let it touch us, let it change us, let us make us available to say, Lord, I'll live as you want me to live, like you. The first thing I want you to see here is the call to follow. This comes out of verse 9, the first part, where it says, As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. Now, we're going to dissect these verses a little at a time here because I want us to go in depth to really grasp the context of all that is taking place at this point in time in Jesus' ministry. Who Jesus is engaging is a man named Matthew. I think it's very easy to make the case that Matthew is a man who is in need. He is a needy sinner. He didn't look needy. He looked as though he had everything going for him. He made a lot of money. He knew how to make deals. He was working both sides of the table, culturally speaking. He was a man, though, who was in need. But yet, when he is called, he does follow. But this was not always true of everyone. In that day and time, take for example, we mentioned this last week, the ten lepers who were all needy because they had leprosy. They were all sinners, but yet only one returned once they experienced the healing power and authority of Jesus. Luke 17, verses 12 through 19, share this story. And it says in verse 12, as he was going into the village, ten men who had leprosy met him, talking about Jesus. They stood at a distance and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus Master, have pity on us. We know that he heals them all, but in 17 and 18, to move the story forward, Jesus asked, where are all ten cleansed? We're not all ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Now the reason I'm sharing that with you is there should be a reality check for each one of us. Even if someone engages and knows that God is real, knows that Jesus is real, knows that the Holy Spirit is real, even if their life is touched in some special way, it doesn't mean they're going to surrender their life and follow the Lord. But there are some who do. So it was one out of the ten who truly was needy, who truly got saved. So not everyone who was called truly followed. But Matthew does follow. And we have to understand the context in which he did follow. Verse 9 says, so as he went from there. Those are the first words of verse 9. You shouldn't read this casually because a lot happened there. So he went on from there. What happened there? Well, take a look, if you would, at chapter 8 and chapter 9. What you see here in chapter 8, let's just hit the high points if we can. You can look with me as I review this. 
You find that there was a man with leprosy that Jesus healed. Then you come across the man who had faith, the centurion. Such great faith, Jesus had not seen such great faith, and his daughter was healed. And then you have many uh, that Jesus healed. He goes to Peter's mother-in-law's house. She was sick. She is healed. The prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. And then he talks about the cost of following Jesus, which we've already addressed. And there's multiple places this is given, and Jesus makes it very clear what it means to follow him. And then he calms the storm, and he tells the disciples, oh, you of little faith, and then, then two demon-possessed men are healed, and then Jesus heals a paralytic. Now, this is what we looked at in detail last week, the healing of the paralytic, and the men brought him, they dug a hole in the roof, they lowered him down, and the front row seats of those who were religious leaders are skeptical, they say he's a blasphemer, he said, what's easier for you to take up your mat and walk, or say your sins are forgiven, so he says to him, take up your mat and walk, your sins are forgiven, which was an illustration, the fact that could not be denied, that the man was healed, which is an evidence, the fact that he, Jesus, was God, and they said, you're blaspheming. But no, the Son of Man has authority to, to forgive sin. But the, my, my point is this, is what I want you to see, and it's so amazing to see in the context is this, is that Jesus was teaching with authority, he was healing with authority, he was calming storms with authority, he was casting out demons with authority, and now he heals and forgives a man's sin with authority as well. And he is now labeled as a blasphemer. He's charged with being a blasphemer. In fact, we know later on during the trial and the crucifixion that he would be called a blasphemer. It's leveled against him uh, during this time. This is found in Matthew 26, 63 through 68. And they said, listen, you hear him? He's blaspheming. What do you think? He's worthy of death, they answered. They spit in his face, struck him with their fist. Others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, Christ, who hits you? And my whole point in that is, throughout his whole public ministry, the religious leaders who were against him, jealous of him, looking for ways to kill him, labeled him a blasphemer, and it is he, the one labeled as a blasphemer, is the one calling Matthew at the tax collector's booth publicly to come and follow him. So the context is, Matthew has this understanding that this man who's doing all of this, all of this amazing things of healing people, uh, calming storms, teaching with authority, who's known among the religious leaders as a blasphemer, he understands who he is following. He knows Many people's lives are being touched, but he also understands there's many who are against him, who are coming against him, and Matthew says, I understand, but I will follow you publicly. See, he understood the call, follow me. Jesus was one who led by example. He was living the truth, he was teaching the truth, and he was calling, listen, Matthew to follow him and learn from him. Jesus encountered Matthew in the public arena, that is the marketplace. This was not behind closed doors in a dark alley. This was and not to say that God doesn't work like that. He does. He did in Nicodemus' life, right? But it was a call to follow, and it was not a covert operation behind closed doors. It was in the public arena with a full understanding that the one who was labeled as a blasphemer was calling him, but he chose to say, I believe in you, I will follow you is a beautiful thing of what happened right here. And if you and I are to engage lost people, we cannot, must not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus, Jesus Christ and what it stands for. See, this is the key to Christians engaging lost people. We must be following Christ if we're going to invite others to follow Christ. You will not have the strength, you will not have the conviction, you will not have the desire to call other people to follow if you're not following yourself. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, he said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. We are to be in the world but not of the world. I want to talk for a few minutes with you about this whole understanding of 
engaging sinners, being with sinners in order to reach sinners. Because some people are very confused about it. Some people take a very loose understanding of this. They say, I must fellowship with those who are lost in order to win the lost. But what I have found that those who enter a relationship on a fellowship basis never call someone else to follow Christ. We call people to follow us as we are following Christ. But if we enter into a relationship with those who are lost and we are not following Christ, it will not be on the forefronts of our minds. It will not be why we engage the relationship. More than likely, it is based on a fellowship factor with the world instead of a call to follow Christ. And it's a big problem. You say, well, I, I, I have some lost people that, that I know. Well, if you go year after year after year after year after year and you never, beginning in your heart, have a desire to understand where they are spiritually, more than likely you have not been praying for their salvation. More than likely it is not priority on your heart that God is desiring to work through you to engage them with the truth that they need to hear the call to follow Christ because you are following Christ. It becomes very challenging. We are to engage with truth, not enjoy fellowship with the world. If we sit and we fellowship, but we never engage with truth, here's what I want you to know. It is not how Jesus lived. Yes, he was charged, and we'll see it in a minute, that Jesus would um, eat, with sinners and tax collectors. Matthew was a tax collector, considered a sinner, and any kind of type of sinner. But when you study the life of Jesus and you look at his living documentary of how he lived his life, he was living in such a way that he was looking for those who were needy, who were sinners in need of a spiritual doctor. And the only prescription that would save their soul was the gospel. It was truth. It was not fellowship. It was a call to fellowship. He didn't come to Matthew and say, hey, Matthew, let's, let's go get a biscuit together this morning. Hey, man, let's just hang out some. No, let me tell you something. Matthew understood who Jesus was fully. And when he was called to follow, he understood he was following the one who was labeled a blasphemer, but one who was living truth and had the authority to forgive sins. Let me tell you, it was all over town that that man came down through the roof and that he was a crippled man, but yet his sins were forgiven. He got his mat and he, he walked out. Let me tell you, everybody was talking about it. And the only ones that were talking negatively about it were those on the front row whose hearts were revealed, who were saying that he was a blasphemer. They were worried that he was going to come in and take over the ministry that they had, the position they had, the popularity they had, the power they had, the money they had, everything they had invested, and they weren't going to allow him to do it. You see it all through the Gospels, and this is why they battle him. They will not yield their hearts to him. They are coming against him. Those were the ones speaking against him, but everybody else is saying, man, is he really? Really the Messiah is he can he forgive sin yes he forgives sin yes he calms the water yes he he heals lepers yes and yes and yes and yes and Matthew knew enough to say yes I know who you are and yes I follow you publicly there was no doubt about who Jesus was and what he was calling people to and this is the danger you and I get into is that we make friends with the lost people but they have no idea that we're even Christian because our, maybe our lifestyle doesn't show it, our, our verbiage doesn't share it, and they don't really see something different. I want you to turn with me over to um, 1 Peter chapter 3, and I want you, this is a very uh, famous verse, great verse, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, and I want to read this to you. I want to just point a few things out to you. 
And I'm not trying to be militant about this, but I'm just trying to say whatever's in our heart ought to be overflowing in our lives, and whatever's overflowing in our lives ought to be evident to others, even sinners that we choose that, that God leads us to be around to the point that it's a very natural segue to speak the truth that they need. Verse 15 says this, but in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. If we don't set apart Christ as Lord in our hearts, it's not going to be what comes out of our lives and our living. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. In preparation, preparation says, and that's really what I'm asking you to do, would you prepare? Would you say, God, I'm available? Would you pray for a lost person? Would you engage a lost person with a heart that is prepared, right? Because your heart is set apart to the Lord, you're willing to pray in that way. But we, then when we do it, we do it with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously or against our good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Okay, that's the rejection side. There's always either an acceptance or a rejection, and it can come in both, and even spiritual battle is found in this. But here's what I want you to see, is that someone, someone sees the hope that you have. What that says is this. They see there's something different about you. And if there's something different about you, and if it's Christ in you, you can't fellowship with the world and be a witness. You can't just hang out and have the same heart. You have to have a heart that is set apart. You have to have a heart that's been prayerful, that's prepared. And you've got to have a heart that's willing to speak about the hope that is in you when you were asked about that. Or when the Lord puts it on your heart to say, you need to engage this person. You need to talk to them about the truth that they need. And see, I don't think we've done the, the foundational work in advance so that when we're placed in the lives of sinners, that, that we can then testify as we should. Peter's a great example of that. He said, I'm going to follow you, Lord. And the Lord said, no, you're not at this time going to follow me. Uh, the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will scatter. He says, no, I'll do it anyway. He follows, Right? He puts himself in the midst of the world without the power of God. And a little servant girl comes up to him and she says, aren't you one of his disciples? And he denies it, denies it, and denies it, right? Well, what happened there is he said he's going to follow, but he's not done the preparatory work. His heart had not been surrendered to the crucifixion and what God had said. He thought he was strong in his own strength. But when he was put in the midst of the world, he did not have the power of God to testify, even to a little servant girl, that he was one of Jesus' disciples. And I think sometimes we think we're going to get in the, in the midst of the world and we're going to do great things for God, but we've not prepared appropriately and we don't have the power of God in us pouring through us to testify as we should. And so what I'm trying to say to you is this. We have to prepare ourselves. We've got to be focused in such a way, just as Jesus was, that he was doing the will of the Father and the ministry. He was known for that. That was the hope that was in him given to the world. And the world saw it. Matthew saw it. Everybody saw it. And so when he is meeting with and eating with sinners, there's no doubt where he stands spiritually is my point. And that's how we have to go into a relationship with those who do not know the Lord so that we are strong in the Lord and in why we are doing what we are doing. Or we won't make it. Now, let's go a little further and secondly see the choice that was made by Matthew. I hope you got all that. Now, verse 9, the second part, it says, Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Now, Matthew could have said no and not followed, like others had. But instead, he follows. He follows publicly. He does not hesitate to follow publicly. In fact, we know from the actions, by him opening his home and inviting sinners to come, that he not only followed publicly, but he opened his home, he prepared a banquet, spent his own money, and he invited sinners into his home for what? engagement of the truth not just fellowship he was following Jesus so we don't know exactly what uh, he said in scripture it's not recorded but we know what he did 
And so his actions speak louder than any words he could have spoken. He was reaching people, the people he knew. He was a sinner in need. Yes, he had a lot of money, but there was an emptiness in his heart. And, and, and Jesus filled that when he followed. And he was inviting others to come find what he found in Christ. This is dinner with sinners. There was a spiritual dynamic that was taking place here where heaven was encountering earth in order to impact eternity. It was not just a social event. It was a spiritual experience of truth encountering the hearts of those in need. In Luke chapter 19, verses 5 through 10, this is where Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house. It says in verse 5, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Why? Because he's got a nice house? No. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. So he's opened up his heart completely. All the people saw this and they, and they began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up. And said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. He's willing to repent and he's willing to make things right. It is an evidence of salvation. Jesus says it himself in verse 9. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. He didn't come for fellowship. He came to save, seek and to save. And Zacchaeus knew that's why he was there. And Zacchaeus was at a point of need and he was searching and the two came together and, and the crowd said, look, he's going to eat at a sinner's house. What in the world? They're muttering this, they're gossiping this, they're talking about it. But let me tell you something, that the life of Zacchaeus proved that the actions of Jesus were not just about fellowship. They were about salvation because he said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. See, Matthew knew exactly who he was following and what he was doing. Matthew's following created a firestorm among the Pharisees toward Jesus. The firestorm moved from their hearts to their tongues. And we'll see that now on the third point, the question raised, verse 11. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? So they got the disciples to the side, and they're going to they're gonna put this tough question on them it really wasn't a question it was more of a uh, you know like why are you following him he eats with sinners they're trying to make a point they're not really asking a question you know over in Luke chapter 7 verse 33 and 35 this is where Jesus himself is speaking and he's saying to them he said for John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine and you say he has a demon the Son of Man came eating and, and drinking, and you say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by all her children or by her actions. See, when they muttered against him when he went with Zacchaeus, and they said, Oh, he's going to eat with a sinner. His actions were proved right in Zacchaeus' salvation and all the change that he made. He's not just fellowshipping. He's impacting a soul because he came to seek and to save that which is lost. In Luke 15, 1 and 2, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they are muttering here in Luke 15. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. I mean, they're constantly saying this all over the place. <sighs> and Jesus just keeps on impacting lives for eternity. He ate with all kinds of sinners. I like that when the scripture says that. See, they weren't really inquiring why he was doing it. It was more of a complaint on their part. It was a blatant pharisaical complaint. You see this in Luke 5 verse 30. See, I believe that they saw it as a rendering yourself spiritually unclean to eat with a sinner. 
You have to understand the Pharisees. They viewed themselves as born into righteousness, and they kept numerous laws as they were considered saints, not sinners. Heritage and law-keeping is what equaled righteousness for them. So you don't hang out with sinners and mess it up. See, it was a self-righteousness. And you and I, sometimes we can be guilty of that. We see sin in people's lives and, and it horrifies us and we go, golly, look at them. Look at their spirit, look at their attitude, look at their actions, look where they are. But we must make sure that we don't become like the Pharisees and become self-righteous and go, oh, I can't eat with them. Man, look how bad they are. That's not right. But on the other hand, we don't go in fellowship with them for the sake of fellowship. You say, well, I'm supposed to be around sinners, so I'm going to get around them, and I'm going to try to connect with them, and I'm going to try to understand how they live. And no, 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 you live a holy life, a righteous life, one that has hope in it that is, that is, that is beaming out. And the way you live and the things you do, people see that your life is different. And in seeing that your life is different, as you call to connect with them, if they're in need and they're ready, they're going to connect with you. And when you do connect with them, you are the one driving the context and the focus and the direction of the relationship because they're the ones in need of truth, not you. You're living it. And so you can give it. And you do it very graciously, lovingly, and give them what they need. And if they receive that, their life will be changed forever. If they reject that, that's on them, not you. But your job is to live it and to give it. But you got to be around them to do it. If you become like a Pharisee and you think you're better, you're never going to be around them. So we're caught in this kind of dilemma. We live in a very simple world, simple society, and we get a burden for them. But we don't want to be repelled to the point that we don't engage. But we want to have a heart and a brokenness, so we do engage. So when we do engage, we find those who are in need, who are willing to accept it. And there may be some, obviously, that are going to reject it. But either way, we understand we're ambassadors and we've got to go forward with the message. What if? Think about these what ifs. What if this church, you, that make up the body of Christ, we never engage sinners. From this point forward till the Lord comes or we die, we never engage a sinner. What's that look like? What if we'd never engage our communities? Never do it. We're just not going to do it. What's that look like? What if we never reach people with the gospel message? What if we only teach one another and never reproduce because we never have a heart to live like Jesus did to be on mission for those who are in need of the truth? How will we ever face God? How will we ever face God when we stand before Him? If we truly know Him. And He looks at us and says, you know, I really wanted you to share the gospel with this person you've been friends with for 15, 20 years, but you never did. You were to be my light and my salt. You were to be my voice. You were to be the testimony of a changed life. You never said anything. I don't want to, I, I don't want to do that. I understand people are going to reject me. I'm okay with that. I'm going to follow Christ publicly. I'm going to take up my, die to self, take up my cross. That's identification with that, and that comes rejection. Okay, good, no problem. And I'm going to follow the Lord. But in my following, I don't want to be held accountable by God for never having a heart for sinners and willing to share the truth that they need. I just don't want to do it. What if, here's one more what if for you, what if they never sent the search boat out for Brett Archibald on that day? No one saw him fall overboard. His first thought when he fell overboard was that he was going to die. He said, I immediately did the math. It would be at least seven hours until his friends realized he was missing. Can you imagine waking up and you do a head count and go, oh, we're missing one, <laughs> right? So that's 14 hours. He said, I'll never last that long. He said, I knew, I knew at that moment I was going to die. He said, but I began to float in the ocean. And as I floated in the ocean, I began to talk to God. He said, the first conversations I had with God were filled with incredible anger. I screamed. I said things I should not have said. And he had a talk with God. 
And then he said, I calmed down. And I began to evolve into reassessing my life. He talks about the fact, and he's a whole book written about this. He said, I talk about the fact that I thought I was a great dad. I had two sons and had done a great job. But he realized it had been about me. And I had missed it. And I began to float on the ocean with incredible regret. As the hours passed, he would fight off cramps, dehydration, the stings from jellyfish, the bumps from sharks. He went through horrible hallucination. And he was out there for 28 and a half hours dealing with himself. But what if the search team had never come? On the hunch of one of the uh, men that was in the group, he said, let's check this one area. They went and they found him. And the medic on board that was part of the rescue said he probably maybe had one more hour before he died. During his time in the ocean, he lost 13 pounds. And he said of his whole ordeal, he said, I believe that my life was spared in order for my life to change. He said, because life is short and if I don't live it well, I will have regrets. I had 28 hours of regrets, and now I have a second chance. He was a man in need. The rescuers came, but what if they hadn't? There's so many analogies that can be taken from this story. Even he living with regret, and then he gets a second chance. I don't want to live with regret in regards to how I live my life for the Lord, and I don't want you to do that either. I want to live like Jesus did, and I hope that you want to live like Jesus did. And there are people in need like this man, spiritually speaking, that need us. I just have to believe that. If we don't, listen, if we cannot believe that that God is powerful enough and that the Holy Spirit lives in us, that if he said we are his ambassadors, he's given us a great commission, that we can't believe that he won't send us and connect us with those who are in need, then we need to shut the doors. Why be a church? Why? Be, why? Why Why go to all the effort if we're just going to have religion? I believe out of, out of personal relationship, as we make ourselves available, God connects us where we need to be connected so that we, like others had for us, we speak the truth into people's lives. Oh God, purify us from worldliness within Make us holy. Give us your heart. Send us out. And may we be faithful to speak the truth that those who are in need, it is the only thing that will rescue them. May we be willing to go out and find those who are lost and in need. Let's be part of the rescue, not just religion. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.